good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for our next Pitzer at Home, Stay at Home with Pitzer College Art Gallery series. I can't believe that almost nearly a year ago today, the Office of Alumni and Family Engagement launched our collaboration with the art galleries and we've been able to host these fantastic events throughout the last year. Um, this collaboration really between our offices was created in part to find new ways um, so new and interesting ways really to keep our community connected during times of social distancing. We are so pleased to bring you this very special edition in partnership um, with our offices. Uh, we'll be highlighting the incredible work of our alumni artist Kim Schosendijk, class of 1995, who will be exploring the creative and artistic visibility to women identifying a non-binary artist um, and bringing equity to the world of art itself. Um, these series that we've been putting together are, have been facilitated by our multi-talented curator, Kiara Ennis, who has been with, uh, been our director and curator of the Pitzer College Art Gallery since 2007. We continue to be incredibly grateful to her and Chris for their willingness to partner with our office um, for this series of very special talks. So with that said, I would like to introduce you to Kiara Ennis. Thank you so much, Brandon. That was very kind of you and very nice. Um, we are thrilled, of course, to be working with you and Brooke Butler and the Office of Alumni Affairs and Family Engagement. And I'd like to say, you know, a very special thanks to you both. Um, and also, of course, to um, Exhibitions and Communications Manager, Chris Nichno for his help in every aspect, you know, of this program. So thank you, Chris. Um, as you know, as you, as Brandon said, you know, during the series, we've been featuring, you know, our talented alumni in the arts. And today we have the great pleasure of connecting with Kim Schoenstatt, who graduated uh, from Pitzer in 1995. And since leaving Pitzer, Kim has had enormous success with her work, showing in some of the most important national and international venues. Today, Kim will be focusing on our social practice projects, as well as talking about the Now Be Here initiative, which is focused on creating an expanding archive and network for women and non-binary identifying artists, as Brandon talked about a minute ago, which is a phenomenal resource for artists, educators, and curators. Re with regards to the Now Be Here project, I'm particularly grateful to Kim for her generosity in hosting two of my curatorial apprentices this semester. Pitzer students Uma Basu and Julia Franken, who are currently working with Kim on this project. This has provided both Kim and Julia with an invaluable mentoring experience and given them firsthand knowledge of the workings of the art world. So thank you so much, Kim, for doing that. Um, just a little, a, a few words about the structure today. Kim will speak for about 45 to 50 minutes after which there will be time uh, for all of you to ask questions. If you do have questions, please put them in the chat. So I will now turn off my mic and say thank you again, Kim. We're so thrilled to have you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to everybody at Pitzer for having me. This is quite an honor. And um, uh, the last time I spoke at Pitzer, was maybe 15 years ago. So it's nice to be back. And thank you to the advancement office and to the art galleries. And it, it has been just an, a total pleasure to work with the curatorial interns, Uma and Julia. And, you know, Kiara, you warned me that they were amazing and they are. I, I mean, like way more capable than I was when I was at Pitzer. Um, so what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna run through a little bit of my work in my career. And, um, you know, I have a very, very kind of career and it's very difficult for me to give a simple elevator pitch about what I do. But one of the through lines to my projects and my practice is, um, I wanna say an archival influence. I definitely have an impulse towards the, where's the origin of the idea and how does the idea travel through the work? And that's uh, where we'll start. Um, I've been thinking a lot about Washington DC in these past few years and our relationship with the government and it. So I wanted to start with uh, a really fun project that was created by Nora Halperin and, and Velmid Lanstra, 
Uh, in Washington, D.C., those are two really amazing independent curators, and they curated a project called Art Not Ads. And the, the concept was that billboard trucks would run around D.C. with art, poetry, and film, and they would just be a visual respite. So this was all the way back in 2006, and so you can imagine how needed that was just last year. Um, the fun thing about this project, and you know, again with my archival instinct, was we kind of told the truck, oh, do a round of the mall. And my partner, Jonathan Fermansky, and I ran around the mall and taking you know, quintessential postcard photos of the art in situ in front of amazing monuments. And then we created a little book about it. Um, then from there, I went back home to Chicago. Uh, this was a project done for the MCA Chicago. And uh, there's John there giving us scale in front of the work. This project was really, um, really came close to home for me because not only was it in my hometown, but it was also in my old neighborhood. The MCA Chicago, tore down the old armory, which was about four blocks from where I grew up, to build the museum. And so this piece was basically about gentrification. Uh, the images you see there that are framed are actually photographs that I took as a child, and it was from a, an assignment for school about my neighborhood. And it has things like this is where the ice cream shop used to be. It's now the water tower. Or this used to be a park. It's now the John Hancock. And so even as a child, I really didn't, I mean, I was documenting these things in that sort of innocent childlike way. And for some reason I kept them and they informed the work. So the source material for this piece is comes from those photographs as well as the squiggly line that you see coming off to the right was the walk that I used to do with my dog. And what you're gonna see in this work is inverted, there's upside down structures uh, like this item right here. That is the armory that was torn down for the building to which this work was installed. And the green shape here was the, the overall shape inverted. From there, I was invited to make an installation at the Van, uh, the Van Abbey Museum in Eindhoven, the Netherlands. And it was based on a series of works called Can Control. I knew how to draw. I was a drawing focus person and not a painting focus person. And so I thought, okay, how, what's the best way for me to learn how to draw? And the easiest way was just to draw with paint and therefore we got spray paint. So then the next question became, how do we, how, now what? Like, okay, I know what the drawing is, but now what do I paint? And so um, we solicited in instructions from the museum community. So the museum curator sent out a generalized letter to the community, the members of the museum and the uh, community members in Eindhoven, asking for instructions for a word, mark, or shape to which we got hundreds of responses. And then we got a few volunteers to come and help spray paint. Each, um, the, the exhibition, because my curator was from Belgium, I organized the shape of the panels to be in the exhibition to be uh, sort of similar to the Atomium. So that was the 1958 Brussels World's Fair architecture. And then from there, it seemed logical to just use World's Fair architecture. So each were, each of the pieces of architecture in these pieces is from wor different World's Fairs. And you can see here, there's a little, roof, a little fade out of our Montana uh, logo, because we got sponsored by Montana spray paints for this, and which is why we have such beautiful colors in this project. From there, um, these next series of pieces, you're gonna see I did a few collaborations because in 2008, I gave birth to our daughter. What I was told in the art world from the people that I was working with and other artists was that was the end of my career, that being pregnant and having a child was basically the death nail in your coffin if you were a woman artist. 
And so I said, okay, well, let me set myself up for success. So I talked to a few friends and said, why don't we do some collaborations? And that way I could continue making work at a really good clip and share a little bit of the, you know, the responsibility with others. So this is the first one that happened with Rita McBride, who's a sculptor. And we called it Tell Me Something Good after the um, song. It's based on the 1969 Art by Telephone exhibition that was at the MCA Chicago. And if you're not familiar with that exhibition, I really strongly recommend looking it up because it's hilarious. The general concept was that there was a bank of telephones in the galleries and artists would phone in with their instructions to which the instructions needed to be executed. Um, Rita and I basically did the same thing. We just called each other with the instructions and then each other executed our instructions. And very similar to the original exhibition, the exhibition cop catalog is a record, a recording of our instructions to each other. The catalog essay done by Lisa Melandry, who is now at the St. Louis Contemporary Art Museum. Um, wrote the essay. And one of the one of the realizations that we had was, well, gee, not everybody has a record player anymore. And so we etched the instructions on the B side of the record. So the catalog as a whole has um, the catalog essay on the sleeve. The record has the instructions that you can hear if you have a record player, or you can read if you want to read them. And this is Rita's telephone, and that's my telephone. The other collaboration I did was with my good friend Mara Lawner, and this was a commission for Los Angeles International Airport. They have an art program where they install temporary works of art. And this, this particular piece you know, I just, I still love it. It's just still one of my favorites. Um, Mara's focus, one of Mara's focus was on the flora and fauna of specific locations. And one of the interesting things about LAX airport is that it displaced a specific weed, milkweed, I think it was. Mara can probably fix that, uh, correct me on that. But, and because it displaced and got rid of this particular plant, it also eradicated an entire butterfly uh, because it lost its habitat. And so the large, this large shape that you see weaving in and out and these shapes are the, that was the plant that the butterfly would come and make its, um, you know, eat and then basically have offsprings on. And then my contribution was the architecture and then we wove everything throughout. Next, I went on to Hartford, Connecticut, where I was invited to do a Matrix 160 exhibition. The Matrix exhibitions began in 1975. They were the first exhibitions of, of contemporary art or young art in museums. It was at the time very risky. It started with Ellsworth Kelly and included Saul Lewitt, Eva Hess, John Baldessari, Ed Ruscha, Viha Selmans, Barbara Cougar, Carrie Mae Weems. And now we have Los Angeles Opera's current matrix. So it's very exciting that it continues to this day. For this work, I went into the community. I looked around, I talked to the community members and we got a bunch of architecture, local architecture. And it, it seemed reasonable to combine it with LA architecture. But then I was thinking, well, what is the main industry of LA? And the main industry of LA was, is, is mostly movies. Um, so I included fictional architecture. So in this work, you're gonna see a lot of fictional ar architecture, the house from North by Northwest. This is the um, Jetson Sky Pad apartment. We have the Super Friends Legion, uh, Hall of Justice and the Legion of Doom. There's the Jacques Tati house with the famous fish fountain. Um, we have the Incredibles house in there. And I mean, it can kind of go on. So the way that the exhibition was set up was there were three primary walls. One had only fictional architecture. The other had only 
uh, Hartford ar architecture. And then the third wall had only um, a combination of the two. The shape that you see running through that geometric shape is based on this Tony Smith sculpture, which as you can see from this archival photograph of the, of the museum is, was installed on the exterior. And soon after my exhibition, they actually had it repainted and installed, which was really cool. And here's the combination. One of the fun things about, you know, part of my, the social practice, part of my project is not only just incorporating the community in these kinds of works, but I also insist on doing community projects with my exhibitions. And with this project, I don't have a photo, a great photo of it, but with this project, we also did a can control with a local arts center. From here, I went on to, um, also trying to figure out how to balance work and life and family. And so I developed this project called the fax, fax drawings, which then became the email drawings because fax machines went away. And the thing is that I was really bad at loading my fax machine and I would often recycle drawings. And so I would load them in incorrectly. And what would happen is that as the, I begin an exhibition by asking for floor plans. And so when they would fax me the floor plans, what would happen was that I would get a, um, basically a combination of a used drawing and the curator's information about the space and their notes and whatnot. And then everything in, is included, including the fax number when appropriate and all of the curatorial notes. The only things that I do for these is just to add some color. When fax machines went away, they just became email drawings and I still have a hard time loading the paper correctly. From here, we went to, I was invited to do a project at LACE, Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions here in Los Angeles. And the charge that I was given was we want to do a one year project, which would basically be a backdrop for, um, a series of performances and lectures and talks, but we want the space to be ever evolving. So I developed a project called Painted Over Under Parts One Through Four. This is a little bit of a complicated uh, project, but I'll try and explain it as best I can. So each, every three months was a different exhibition. I invited um, Les Figs Press to curate a series of writers or authors, Jens Hoffman to curate artists, and Aaron Cullerton to curate a group of architects. Each project was done on the walls. And, and when the project was done, we basically put on a giant sticker or a vinyl cut of a section of a drawing, which you can see has happened here. This is the final shot. And then the whole thing is painted out. But what the sticker or the draw or the vinyl cut did was it preserved parts of everybody's project. So over here, you're gonna find there's some writing that you can read still through the vinyl cut. And so at the very end of the project, once everybody had done their projects, we had put the sticker on, we had painted everything out. The last thing we did was remove the stickers. And so, what you find behind was a sort of time capsule of that of each project. From there, I went to Germany. I was invited to do two exhibitions back to back, one in Cologne and one in uh, Munich. This one was at M29 Gallery in Cologne. And for this, I uh, was inspired by a local piece of uh, sculpture that was inserted outside of the Dom, which is also outside the train station. And what I really liked about this work was not only was it geometric, but it was also reflective. It reflected people's experiences and showed them the world in a different way. I based the works off of that. And also at the same time, I was making work for a uh, revised exhibition of the Live in Your Head show um, by Harold Zaman which Jens Hoffman was curating up at the Wattis Institute in San Francisco. And so in here, you're gonna see, I was, I was not quite over these uh, Richard Serra pieces, which was, he was an artist in the show in the original 
60, 70 something. I'm, I didn't write that one down. Um, but Stara was part of the original Live in Your Head show. And so for the works that I was making for that show, I included his works, but I colored them in a very annoying way, which he would never like. For each um, exhibition that I make, I really enjoy making ephemera. And so these are postcard, that's part of what I call the sort of sightline series or postcard series, and where I take vintage postcards and then I insert architecture on top of them. They began with actual, like actual sized postcards, but those are so small, they're very hard to work on. So I started making archival prints of the postcards and then inserting my drawings and such over it. This is an installation view of the Sabina Kunz show in Munich, Germany. And here you, you can see two wall drawings, but this time, instead of being massive and on a very large scale, these are a lot more intimate. This is in more of a smaller gallery setting. And these were also coming out of the Harold Zeman work. And these are some of the, for each one wall drawing that I do, I make 10 to 20 preliminary drawings. And so these, we framed some of the preliminary drawings and collage, I collaged in the um, supports. From there, I went on to LA Louvre Gallery here in Los Angeles and exterior work. This work was based on the um, unrealized architecture in Los Angeles. So LA has a very interesting relationship with architecture. It seems to treat it a little bit like props that can be put up and torn down quite easily. And um, I was reacting to that a little bit here. So all of these pieces in here are realized by uh, unrealized architecture. And then the purple searchlight shapes you see are referencing Ed Ruscha's famous painting. Back to the archival instinct. So for each one of my works, I always include a source material sheet because I don't really expect everybody to be in my head and I wanna share my research and I wanna give you a little bit of a clue and maybe a little bit of a conversation starter for where I'm going and how I'm putting things together. And the interesting thing to me about um, the research is every time I think, oh, I'm going somewhere, there won't be much interesting architecture. There's always really fascinating architecture. Um, my favorite is this one here, which is a Rem Cool House piece of architecture that was um, proposed for the Venice Canals. And it was based on the Hollywood Squares show, was the inspiration for that. From here, I went to Provo, Utah with, at BYU Art Museum. And, B, and Provo, Utah was absolutely one of those places where I was like, golly gee, I don't know. I started talking with, on my site visit, I started talking with locals, we drove around quite a bit and I had way more source material than I would ever need. And the interesting thing is I began to really understand and I, I knew this before, but it didn't really drive home, but that one space can have so many different lives. And so in, in Provo in particular, there was one space, it was like an abandoned chocolate factory. And it began as a chocolate factory and then it became the candy store and then it became the artist complex and now it's a law office. And so everybody, and because Provo is such a small town, the people, everybody came and everybody was sharing their stories about that one building. And it was really fascinating to hear um, how one piece of, of architecture or a built structure could really provide so much history and stories. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to point out about this work is that it's, it's basically based on, on divergent realities. So one of the BYU, one of their premier programs is digital animation. They are a feeder school for all of the animation schools. And one of the things I became fascinated with was wireframe. Um, this, the way that they make wireframes for basically any object before they animate it. And so the drawing itself 
has two realities. It has a wireframe drawing, which is, is on this side, and then the drawing is, is mirrored on the other side with just reality. And so then what we did was you can see here, here's reality without the wireframes, and then here it is with wireframe. But once the piece came off the wall and into reality, so did the cubes. So the cubes are flat when they're painted on the wall and then they're in 3D once they come off of the wall. Um, this work was also really special because again, the, the social engagement practice of mine is always to invite others to participate. And we had so much participation, it was incredible. We had generations of families come to help paint. There were performances, there were talks about the architecture. I really enjoyed, that was a very special community. From here, I went to, I was awarded a Metro contract for the um, Fairview Heights station. And this is um, soon to be installed. And from here, I, again, working with members from the community, we talked about local architecture and then I just started digging. And, you know, this community in particular in Inglewood and, um, and Hyde Park and Fairview Heights area, they, there's so much history there. It's just incredible. And it's just been such a thrill and honor to really get to know and explore that history and that community. From there, I had a uh, local gallery exhibition at Shimento Contemporary. And this was very exciting to me because I, I'd been doing so many big projects that it was really fun to do a gallery show. And of course, with this, I had a social engagement project, which was called the Book Truck. And the Book Truck invited artists, curators, and um, I think it was just yeah, artists and curators to contribute a book of what they were currently reading. And they were all cataloged and documented. And then they were available on a cart. And the community could come and peruse and look at the books that the community was reading. The whole project is, of course, archived on my website. And you can see what artists and curators um, participated. And then these were some of the works from that exhibition. Um, these were cutout works, and they uh, each have a 3D element, except for the bench, which is a bench. Um, and there's a wire part which comes off the wall and then continues the geometric shape. From there, um, I went to see an exhibition at the brand new gallery called Hauser and Worth, and they were doing an exhibition called Revolution in the Making. And the Revolution in the Making was an all uh, woman identifying ex sculpture exhibition. And I became a little frustrated because I, I kind of knew everyone. There weren't any surprises. And it was a little frustrating because I felt like with such a large space and with such a large idea, you could have the ability to really sh share the stage and shine a light on artists who don't always get that kind of recognition. So after one of the talk, I turned to Andrea Stang, who at the time was the head of education, and kind of flippantly said, hey, what do you think about getting all of the other women identifying and non-binary artists in LA to come and show up? And she just said, yeah, okay. And I was like, wait, what now? Okay. So two months later, um, we basically sent out a chain letter. We sent out a letter. We made a lot of lists, and we sent a letter out that said, we'd love for you to show up. And please pass this on to everybody so everybody who wants to be included can be included. And what we were thinking, maybe we'd get three to 500 people, maybe. Um, and in 2016, the thing is, you have to remember, this was slightly before, just before the election. This was August. So the election hadn't happened yet. Um, the Me Too movement was just starting and the Women's March definitely wasn't happening yet. So this was our moment in the sun and it was a hot August day and it was incredible. We had, as you can see, almost 900 artists RSVP. We had over 700 attend and it was really joyous and incredible and moving. And it was a very special moment just to be present with everybody in uh, not at an opening, not at a lecture, but just there. And then this happened. Um, so that project got a lot of attention. 
and it got attention for a multitude of reasons. And one of the, uh, I, this is just a selection of some of the press. Um, one of my favorite articles said, you know, this isn't just a, an interesting document, it's a wake up call. And that was kind of the point was there's a few more artists in the world than y'all are showing and the museums and galleries need to be a little bit more inclusive. And at that point, representation in the galleries of not of women to men was about a 70, 30, you know, 70, 30, 60, maybe 60, 40 sometimes. And then when you really start drilling down on that about looking at artists of color, it was just pathetic. So from there, I, the invitations just sort of started and got rolling. Um, and the first stop was New York. And you can see Shanique Smith right here. She was our local artist collaborator. Um, I realized that with each, I know my city, I know Los Angeles, my, my city knows me, they trust me, but I don't know other cities. So I can't go into another city and say, hey, trust me, I know everybody and I'm gonna collect everybody. That's just not true, but I am pretty good at organizing. So I always collaborate with a local artist and they, um, and basically they make the lists and I support with a lot of the infrastructure. From there, we went to Miami and we were hosted by the Perez Museum and Jane Hart with our, was our local artist collaborator. Um, oh, let me also say, Paola, I always collaborate with photographers because I'm not a photographer. And so this photo was taken with, the first photo in LA was with um, Isabel Avila and Carrie Yuri, two amazing photographers. And then New York was um, Paola Kudaki. And then in uh, Miami was Jesse Schilling and Jane Hart was our local collaborator. And then in DC, Lynn Myers was our local collaborator and Kim Johnson was our photographer. In DC, um, something interesting happened where I kept asking, hey, can we do this? And they kept saying yes. So in DC, we grew to include an artist resource fair after the exhibition, I mean, after the gathering. So you can see here, there's a little um, second level mezzanine area. And what happened there was that 17 um, artist support nonprofits gathered. They each had a little cocktail table. They each had their, you know, uh, a tent that said what they, who they were and what they did. And they all had their materials and the artists could go up, grab a drink, grab a snack and go mingle with all of their supports. And it was just really special and really amazing. We also included something called Now Let's Talk. And the original idea was it was going to point. It was just gonna point to all of the other events happening within a two week period of any, anything, if a woman identifying artist or non-binary artist was performing, we were going to point towards it. But then what started happening was that people started creating content. And we even had our curator from the New York group Carmen Hermo, who created a video series for the Hirschhorn, and the Hirschhorn showed it. it was a 24-hour cycle of, women, of feminist videos and films, which was really incredible. We called that Now Let's Talk. And on the website, if you look at the events program section, you'll see that that section houses the entire history of that, of all of those events. Um, from there, I went to Volta, courtesy of Shermento Contemporary. She was very generous and brought me there for a solo booth. Um, and of course, me being me, I kept saying, what about this? What about this? And everybody kept saying yes. So the concept with this was that I would very quickly, within four hours, slap up a wall drawing. I, and then we would invite the public who or passers-by to contribute with their perspective line. So I would be there with a, you know, with string and a thumbtack and scissors. And people would say, start here and end there, start here and here, start here and here. And so what you really are seeing is a collection of the community's perspectives. 
And I was very careful with my words with this project where we would say, your line is pressing, is pushing down on somebody else's line. Are you comfortable with that? Or your line is lifting up somebody else's perspective. Are you comfortable with that? And the only rules that I had was you could push up, push down, you could tie on, but you could never remove somebody else's perspective line. And so what we ended up with was literally a web of perspectives. So this is the, this is the progression, day one, day two, day three, and this is ultimately day four. And um, it was a really incredible experience. It was, I mean, the, the thought that people were putting into where their perspective lines were going and how they were interacting with others' perspective lines was really incredible. And I mean, it's just, it's such a fun project. I'd love to do that again someday. Um, and this project won the Bahamar Art Prize. So Eva and I were very thrilled with that. And then shortly after that, I had another show with Eva Shimento at Shimento Contemporary. And again, I included, this is the larger. So what you saw in the previous one is this is sort of an excerpt of this larger wall drawing. And then again, we did the perspective lines. Um, this was a little bit more controlled because it was a gallery setting. And we uh, just invited a small set of people to add their perspective lines. But the concept with these is, you know, the idea with these is that should somebody purchase one for their home, then their guests and their families would be adding their perspective lines. And these were some of the works from that show. And you can see I'm, I'm still continuing to work with the perspective line and the idea of weaving things. So these particular pieces, you can see the drawing is literally suspended within the frame by the perspective lines. The lines go from the drawing and they weave into an inner frame. And then there is an exterior frame that has a double pane of plexiglass. So it sees through to the wall, which has the complete drawing to which this piece is excerpted from. And then these works are excerpts from the larger wall drawing. And with this, I had been thinking a lot about razzle dazzle camouflage from uh, World War II. And these have the shape which exists on three planes. There is the three-dimensional razzle dazzle shape painted, which is literally strapped or attached to the Bristol board. And then the shape extends out from the frame into reality onto a shaped wood. And I was thinking about Razzle Dazzle because I was invited to do a wetsuit. And I had read somewhere that if um, sharks are very confused by camouflage. And so I thought, well, clearly I don't want anybody being eaten when they're, um, or bitten when they're using my wetsuit. So I'm gonna use something like that. And so you can see here, this is one of the World War II razzle dazzle patterns. And then this is one of the patternings for the wetsuit. That was just so much fun. One of the aspects from that Volta um, Bahamar Art Prize was the Bahamar Commission. And so I was sent to the Bahamas, which is a very special place to meet with the local community. We had a large round table and where they gave me pages and pages and pages of places to see and all the history and who to talk to. And then another local artist and I ran around the island and um, ate good food and took a ton of pictures. And what you results here is a combination of all of that research and the stories. And so this is basically in the concierge area. This is the entrance to the SLS Bahamar hotel and the concierge, each concierge has that source material sheet so that when they're talking with people and they're explaining things, then they have the physical reference right there. From there, I went on to do a private commission in Washington, DC. And this was a really fun work to do. 
uh, it incorporates the private corporation has offices around the world. And so each office sent in their favorite pieces of architecture from their cities. And then we met as a team and everybody voted on which ones they liked. And then I made a work based on it. And again, going back to Tony Smith that I really can't get away from, there he is again, but this time he's in Washington, DC at the National Gallery of Art. And this is in the sculpture um, garden, which was uh, close to where that private corporation was. And this was a two part, uh, a two level installation. And so you can see over here, uh, you see the, the sort of subtle shift of color. I'm gonna flip back. And then that's coming down into this one. So as this one is snaking up into the wall, then it's coming up out of the floor over here. And then COVID hits and what do you do? Well, you get to work in your studio and I had a lot of fun. I was thinking a lot about my mom who made this beautiful needlepoint chair and I made this wacky drawing. Um, and then I randomly contacted my friend, Stephen Beyer who makes sculpture, sculptural additions and said, hey, well, what do you think about making a sculpture out of this small model? And he said, okay, that sounds good, let's do it. So we're realizing this is called Tetherball for Kippenberger and it's gonna be nine feet. And then I started teaching myself how to paint. But also within all of that, I started really focusing back onto now be here because I had been really, I had been focusing on two reunions to be happening in 2020. One was gonna be in Washington DC at the National Gallery of Art. The other was going to be at UCLA at the School of Art and Architecture and CAP UCLA. And in LA, we were going to have at camp the school not very much like I will be safe mentally and physically to gather in these large crowds again so I also focused pretty quickly on moving the project online so the photographs that were happening in 2016 and 2017 I had made a pretty rickety um, website the website listed the names of the artists in basically an excel sheet and the numbers that correlated to them so you could find them in the photographs, but it didn't hot link to their work. And the response that I got was a list of 3000 names is great, but we really wanna see the work and we really need to make it easy. So I got to work, I raised funds and created this directory. I talked to curators and art consultants and asked them, how do they find artists? What are they looking for? What do they need? What information do they most need? And they said, we need to know where they are. So country, state, city. And then we wanna know, we wanna be able to narrow it down by genre and medium. And so that's how the website was born. And we currently have nearly 800 artists from 14 countries. The other thing that I wanted to point out is that this website is, um, is, is a little bit unique in that it is a free directory for the artists. I didn't want, to have equity issues on top of equity issues, right? Like this website is supposed to be a platform to make it easy to connect with women artists. And I didn't want a barrier to entry to be a price of admission. So this is free to artists to join. As long as you identify as a woman or non-binary, you are welcome to join. I also shifted, we also here, we, you can see where we're listing the events and programs. Um, Soon after we got, I spent part of my, pan, a lot of my pandemic working on this and we got the website up and going and everything was going great. And then the question became like, golly gee, um, now what? And so what's next? Well, the next thing we need to do is get the work into the world. So I have been friendly with the Hello Sunshine folks, which is Witherspoon's production company and media company and my point to them was this is great you're telling a lot of people's a lot of women's stories but you're not telling them the art you're missing art and they said you're right so once a month they feature one of the artists from now be here it's randomly selected through a random number generator so we try to avoid bias 
and they feature it and I um, am, it's super fun and super grateful. Uh, the other thing that happened was that I called Taras uh, Matla over at University of Maryland and Kiara and said, hey, I'm underwater with this thing. I have big ideas and I need help. And they both said, got your back. And so they both supplied me with some paid interns because I didn't want to have interns that I couldn't pay. Um, so everybody's getting course credit. Everybody is doing fabulous work and everybody gets um, kudos where kudos are due. So we have the guest curator initiative, which is what Patricia is working on from the University of Maryland. She is a um, graduate student in curation and that project focuses, connects curators and artists from the directory to create content about their work. And we have our first Deborah, our first interview, Deborah Jack is up. And then our second interview with Marta Perez will be up uh, when it's transcribed because it was done in her native tongue. And, um, and Patricia just needs to transcribe that both into English and also in Spanish. And then also from there, I shifted uh, because we couldn't have the artist resource fair. I put the resources online. And I, and I focused it down into a very short curated list because at that time I was feeling very overwhelmed. And so listing 50 places wasn't a good idea, even for myself, I was overwhelmed with even that. So I really narrowed it down to places that I felt were really helpful. I also called a bunch of these places and negotiated discounts because why not? What's the worst that's gonna happen? They say no. And a lot of them said yes. So the next thing I was working on during my, my COVID years was um, I have a show coming up at Art Center and that's going to be at the Mullen Gallery that's curated with Julie Joyce and Christina Valentine. And it was it what had been slated for September of 2020 and it will now be this year. Oh, and this, I'm sorry, I kind of breezed right over that. This show is based on research that I had done in 2019 on Eileen Gray, the architect, artist, and furniture maker. Um, and she has an incredible story. And then the other thing that I've been working on is advocating, uh, additionally advocating for artists and artist rights with Americans for the Arts. And I just spoke at their um, one of their conferences, we are trying to get the Artist Museum Partnership Act reintroduced and passed. It was originally proposed by John Lewis and our local great uh, Stanley Grinstein, who's of Gemini Gel. And, and the basic gist of the bill is to give artists the right to claim the fair market value of our work if we donate our work to a museum. Currently, if I donate one of my pieces to LACMA on my taxes, I can take the pencils <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> so, but if I, if Kira owned the work she, and she donated, it, then she could take fair market value. And so this is a rather easy right to wrong, especially during these moments when so many artists are out of work. It's very important and I'm very honored to be helping to work on that. So with that, I've talked for a long time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Kim. The other equity uh, projects that you're involved in. This is really fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Thank you. We do have um, a question in the chat, which I'm going to ask you from Wilhelmina, um, who has asked, what do you do with temporary installations like the one at LAX, um, sorry, not LAX, uh, Los Angeles Airport. Uh, oh, yeah. After they've been displayed. Yeah, they get painted out. And, um, and one of the fun things about wall drawings is that it's very cheap storage. So each wall drawing has a packet, an instruction packet. And uh, the reason for that is that I'm not gonna be around. And so, you know, there's instructions, there's a transparency, there's the drawing, there's paint chips that refer to all the colors. And so each wall drawing can be cre recreated with basically without me. You don't need me to make that piece. So that it seems weird, but it's, um, it's actually a 
something I very much enjoy because I don't have to store all those pieces. I'd also like to say hi to Ann Armenta, my roommate from Pitzer College. <laughs> That's great. Um, I'm sure there'll be other uh, questions coming in. Uh, Brandon has said this is absolutely incredible. Thanks, Brandon, for that. Um, I had a question. I was really excited to see that you were included in the um, in the Harold Zaman show at CCA, and that you were, it must have been really interesting working with with Jens Hoffman. Um, and you, the particular piece that you were working on, which was um, you know, about or in reference to uh, Sarah. And I was wondering whether it was a critique of the masculinity of the work or the heaviness of the work. Um, given that that particular show, When Ash Juice Become Form, you know, had, it had something like, you know, 69 artists in that show, the original one in 1969, and only, you know, two or three of them were women. So I'm wondering whether- Oh yeah. Yeah, it was. Okay. Oh, yeah. No, I definitely was like, that's why I used salmon pink. Like it, it. And the other thing is that those pieces that Sarah did, he he has a very conflicted relationship with them as well. And so I kind of and I like the idea they're called the prop pieces. And so what I did was they were literally propping up other things. Right. So I went I used vintage photographs or postcards from San Francisco. And then those pieces, which I, you know, basically repainted with really absurd and obnoxious colors, were literally propping up these, you know, pieces of architecture um, from San Francisco. And it absolutely was because, and, you know, art by telephone was the same thing. I have no idea. I don't think there were that many women, if any, in art by telephone. And that was the moment too. You know, it was like a bunch of white dudes was basically that moment in art history. Completely agree with you. And so in that particular show, did did Hoffman um, address that issue? Um, did he invite, you know, artists of color and more women and... Yeah, he was, he was very sensitive to that. And it was a very, um, it, that was absolutely one of those group shows where I felt very much out of my league because I was very like, oh, wow, I'm in with these people. Wow. You know, and and it was a very it was a well-balanced show in that way. And um, I really I really and that was a fun show to be part of. And he did a lot of programming with that show, too. And that was also part of the art by telephone that Rita and I did was we also just wanted it to be only women because the previous art by telephone was just so male um and that's you know so it's like me and rita and lisa kind of reclaiming it yeah i love the look of that project it's very so much fun. It's so fun. amazing um and of course there was the telephone piece in that um when attitudes become form you know the original exhibition actually i don't want to hog you but given that there's no there's no questions in the chat. I may ask you another question if that's okay with everyone. Um, this is really exciting to talk to you about all of this. Uh, oh, here we go, actually. Um, Holly has a question. Uh, in your Now Be Here gatherings, have you had any Pitzer graduates attend by surprise? Um, I think we have. And, but I, I wouldn't know because, you know, these gatherings are so huge. It's like literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. But I also know that I generally reach out to you guys and say, hey, I'm going to be like at the Wadsworth Athenaeum show. We actually I worked with the Alumni Association. We had a, a Pitzer group come in and come to the opening and we had drinks and, and visited and it was really fun. So, you know, I'm I'm always trying to you know, wrangle back the Pitzer community um, to join in on a lot of these things. So the, the thank you for that, Holly. Um, the, and of course, you will now be getting more, given that you've had these two amazing, you know, Pitzer students working with you. And hopefully, if you're up for it, I hope you'll um, host another couple of students next year. 
Well, I'm going to have to because these students have been so successful that we got all yeses with every like every out with they. So let me back up and, and focus on what they've been helping with is that the idea was with the um, everybody with remote learning. Uma was in Vermont and Julia was in Seattle. And so they were getting to know their local communities and help with outreach because now Be Here only traveled to four major cities, but that doesn't reflect the name. The next. Now be here. Very frozen. Yeah, I think we lost you for a little bit. Okay, so I'll go back. Um, where did I drop out? Slow and purposeful. <laughs> um, I a little bit before that. Okay. Um, with Uma and Julia, what we're working on is slow and purposeful outreach to the cities that they are currently living in, Seattle and um, Seattle and Vermont, or I should say, state of Washington and state of Vermont. And they will, and we strategically sent out letters to different arts institutions and to uh, different artists. And we've had just such warm and welcoming responses that they really started something and it's very exciting. And I can't wait, like we, I, I just can't wait. I can't talk too much about it because nothing's really solidified and I don't wanna, I wanna, don't wanna screw anything up, but yeah. Yeah, from what I hear, it's very, very exciting. And I'm just getting more so. So we do have another question um, from Christopher Trinakti. And I apologize if I've mispronounced your last name. And Christopher asks, I was wondering if you could comment on the productive way you use archives and your research and your creative ideas. Is there a productive tension there or a typical way you approach it? Um, that's a great question. And I let me start by saying that my interest in archiving started from my first job outside of out of Pitzer. So through Pitzer College, I was sort of the, the lackey of the art department and it was uh, Michael Woodcock was my professor and he, I, everything he invited to, I went to. And he had, we had a, Eli Broad had just built the Broad Center and we had the first inaugural show which was um, an artist named John Baldessari. And basically through, you know, pluck and vinegar, I got a, I started working for Baldessari pretty much out of Pitzer. My first job for him was basically working on his archives. And so I could see the value of archiving your own work, but also running a studio. So the question of how does, um, how is archives research used? I, I, just got hit by the archive bug. Like I love researching an institution. I love researching a place. I love researching a city. I love talking to the people who are there and, you know, like just trying to dig in and dig through all of the stories. Um, and then I just have to start kind of, I mean, once I start with all of that research, then I start parsing it all out to find the shapes because ultimately with the bigger wall drawings, what I'm doing is I'm making, I'm still making art. And so I still want it to move and to flow and to, and to have that kind of tension. And so, you know, just, you know, similar to the wall drawings where I make 20 something drawings for every one, you know, for every one piece that has 20 something buildings in it, there's 50 more behind it. So there is tension because it's interested, you know, there is a tension there because you wanna shove everything in. And at the beginning of my career, I absolutely did that and it just didn't make sense. And so then I started having to pull back and pull back and, and really start focusing on in on which, which story I wanted to communicate. 
Thank you very much, Kim. And I think we're, we're coming up to the end now, um, or rather we've, we've gone over time, but I just wanted to give you this message from Jessica Gavilanes, and I apologize for mispronouncing your last name. And she says, fantastic to see Yay. you. Awesome work. Awesome. Yay. Yes, and I did threaten um, the co-op that I would tell tales, but you know, they're, we're running out of time. <laughs> so, um, does anybody want to ask him a final question before we sign off for the day? And of course, you know, this will, this has been recorded. So if anybody wants to watch this again, it will be available very soon. Um, and I just want to thank you so much. This has been an absolute pleasure. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank uh, you so much. It was so fun. It's, it's always fun to come back to Pitzer. You guys are doing incredible work. And thank you again for also, you know, sharing your students. It's, they're so incredible. And it's so exciting to see, you know, next phase of Pitzer. Well, thanks to you, they're just getting this extraordinary mentoring experience, which is, you know, invaluable. Where do you get that? All right. Well, thank you. Thank you again. And thanks everybody for joining this amazing talk today. Hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Bye.